Hello, and welcome to this MCA webinar on extreme environment operation of DC motors. What are the challenges and what is required? Presented to you by Maxon Motor AG. This webinar will be recorded, and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions on the presentation material, please feel free to submit questions via the panel on your right. Questions will be answered as time permits. If your question is not answered, the presenters will follow up with you after the presentation. My name is Kathleen Strait with MCA, and our presenters today are Dr. Dr. Kafader and Dr. Phillips with Maxon Motor AG. Dr. Kafader was born in Sarnen, Switzerland, was awarded a physics degree and MBA from the Federal Institute of Technology, ETH Zurich, and a doctorate from the UHA Mulhouse in France. He started his career at the ETH Solid State Physics Department, working on the epitaxy of semiconductor heterostructures and also attended lectures on general didactics and specialized training for technology education. For more than 15 years, Dr. Kavader has been responsible for technical training at Maxon Motor. In this function, he has presented many training courses and seminars for the Maxon staff and customers from where resulted a textbook on the selection of high-precision microdrives. Our other presenter is Dr. Robin Phillips. is from the United Kingdom. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics from Bristol University in the UK, as well as a doctorate in astrophysics from the University of Kent at Canterbury in the UK. He is fluent in both English and German, and Dr. Phillips is the technical project manager and head of aerospace projects at Maxon Motor AG in Switzerland. I want to take a brief moment and thank our sponsors of today's webinar. Maxon Precision Motors is a leading supplier of high precision drives and systems in the USA. Products include small, high quality brush and brushless DC motors. These advanced motors range in size from 4 millimeters to 90 millimeters and are available up to 500 watts. Maxon combines electric motors, gears, and DC motor controls into high precision intelligent drive systems that can be custom made to fit the specific needs of customer applications. Maxon helps provide innovative solutions at competitive prices for numerous applications in various markets, such as industrial automation and robotics, medical technology, security technology, instrumentation, and communications. Our other sponsor is Electromate, Maxon Motors' exclusive representative in Canada. Recognized as a premier source for high-performance robotic and mechatronic solutions, Electromate offers AC and DC servo and stepper motors, drives, controls, positioning systems, and robots. Electromate supports customers via an, an extensive product selection, just-in-time and consignment inventory, dedicated customer service, and technical engineering support. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Please take it away. Yeah. Hello, my name is Oscar Fader, and I welcome you on this webinar here on, on deep fried motors, as you can see. Uh, actually, as you know, oops, here we are. It's about extreme environment operation of uh, DC servo motors. So we will talk about the challenges and uh, what needs to be required by these drives. Now, what are extreme operation applications? So some examples are deep hole drilling where you have operation in oil at high temperature, at high pressure, with vibration and shocks. Another area is ultra-high vacuum applications where the challenge is uh, or are the high temperatures during the outgassing before you put it into the, the high vacuum and then in the vacuum you want to have a low outgassing le level or a third application field or space applications where you have high and low temperatures or in very short uh, periods of time you have a vibrations during launch and uh, particularly if you have a, an optic uh, satellite for example you also want to have a low outgassing level. Now how do we organize uh, this webinar? We have uh, split it up in two parts. First I'll give you the background information on DC motors. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how, about how to select motors, about uh, the key motor parameters which are needed for selection. Then I will uh, tell you a little bit about brush DC motors versus brushless DC motors and how we uh, ended up with this uh, Maxon heavy-duty 
EC motors, where then in the second part, uh, Robin will take over and he will tell you about testing of these motors and uh, with the testing you will see what these motors can really do and what they can support. Okay, let's start with part one, the motor background. When we talk about selection of motors, uh, we have developed, let's say, this systematic selection process consisting of seven steps. For me, always the most important one is the first step, is gaining an overview, know what exactly uh, you want to do with your drive, uh, how the situation looks like. In this uh, overview, you also define uh, what are the ambient conditions, how do you want to communicate, uh, you define how should control look like, how accurate it should be a little bit, and of course you also define how the mechanics looks like and how, how the load should be moved. And then in a next step two and three, you have a closer look then at load, at how the drive looks like, and only once you have done step one, two, three, you can really go in the details and select the gear head and motor type for a particular application. Actually, today we will focus a little bit on, on this here, particularly on step five and six about motor type and winding selection. At the end, of course, you have to verify that uh, what you want to do from a point of view of control, that it really works so that you have selected the right uh, sensor and the right control. One way of uh, looking at this is uh, considering the drive system as a black box. This helps quite a lot in the situation analysis. So you see, uh, or you first define what do you want to do, what's the task of your drive, and then you have to make sure that the quality, that the outcome of your task is is correct one for what you want to do. You have to also look at power consideration. Is there enough electrical power, current voltage, to do whatever you want to do from a mechanical point of view, uh, mechanical power given as force and velocity or if you have a rotational load and torque and, and rotational speed. Uh, today, of course, we will focus a little bit on the green sections here. It's about environment. So what is the temperature around the motor? What is the atmosphere? Or is there any vibration? But always think uh, about that also a drive creates emissions which go in the same way. So uh, a drive also creates heat, makes noise and in some cases also electromagnetic uh, emissions. When talking about application, essentially at the end what the motor must do is deliver a certain amount of torque at a given speed. And this is our standard diagram how we represent such uh, operating points of uh, torque and speed. It's uh, the diagram gives you the speed as a function of the torque. Of course, you can also have uh, more than one operating point. For example, a second one would be at a much higher speed, but maybe at a lower torque. Or another operating point could be uh, maintaining a position against an external force like gravity. That would be at speed zero. Or during acceleration, of course, you have uh, a speeding up of, uh, of your drive, which usually uh, needs uh, more torque to accelerate all the mass inertias. So at the end of uh, this uh, acceleration process, you typically have uh, the highest torque and the highest speed. Now, of course, the first thing you have to consider and to look at is that your motor has high enough speed to cover all the operating points. In this case here, what you can see is that the operating range is limited here by the maximum permissible speed, and it cannot reach this uh, operating point at high speed. You find information about the maximum permissible speed of a motor in the Maxim catalog, for example, in line 23 or in the diagram, so which this is the limit, the upper limit of the diagram. So speed usually is a simple task to, to find out. A little bit more complicated are torque, so how big is the torque to accelerate, how large is friction, so there's a little bit more uh, yeah, time and, and effort involved to get all this information. Uh, at the end, if you have all these operating points, what you can do is condense them into just essentially three values. One value is an average load. Con it, uh, 
corresponds to the root mean square average over uh, operating cycles, that's essentially the continuous load, or in other words, the motor would heat up in the same way uh, during an operate, operating cycle as if it was driven with this root mean square average load. Another important point is, uh, or another two other key values here, that's where we need to be, is uh, the maximum load at the maximum speed, that I call it the extreme operation point, and the amount of time it takes uh, to run the motor at this point here. So from point of view of torque, you have to make sure, here we are, that the continuous operating range expands to higher level than this, than this root mean square, uh, square average load. So what you need is a motor with a nominal torque which is higher than this root mean square average. Short term operation can still be uh, higher at a higher torque. Now where do you find the information about this? is in uh, nominal torques in line 5 of uh, motor data and the nominal torque actually is a thermal limit so operating a motor at in a short term operating range for example would result in too high a temperature and the critical temperature in motors is the winding temperature a very good example showing you that uh, the limits of continuous operating range has something to do with the temperature and uh, how hot the motor gets is if you look at the uh, heavy duty motors operating range. Typically uh, for standard motors we give such a diagram with the red area corresponding to the continuous operating range. Now if the ambient is hotter, for example uh, 100 degree, 150 degree or 200 centigrade then you can see that the hotter the ambient is, the less the heat can dissipate and that's why this border of the continuous operating range is reduced more and more. It's not only the ambient temperature which plays a role but also how heat is dissipated. For example, in oil you have a much better heat contact to the, the winding which gets hot. So heat is dissipated much better and which results in turn that you can have much higher torque uh, when operating such a motor in oil than what you can do in air. So that's exactly the same motor once operating in air and here in oil and you can see from the scale of the torque M that uh, you can reach really reach much higher torques when operating in oil. As I've mentioned already you can run the motor at higher torques but only a limited amount of time and the big question is how long is short. Now, it all depends on how fast the most critical part of the motor, that's the winding, heats up. And this is given in line 19 in a number called thermal time constant of the winding, which gives an internal time scale of the heating of the winding. So you can find it here in line 19. For this motor, for example, it's a little bit more than 20 seconds. Now, what does it mean or how is this uh, diagram to be interpreted? What you can see down here is that you can load the motor up to twice the continuous load quite easily and quite a long time, about five times this thermal time constant. For this motor this would correspond to approximately 100 or more seconds, so almost two minutes. So short term operation can be quite long, as long as uh, the overload is not too high. But you can also see down here that at three times the continuous torque, the, the, uh, the duration is much shorter than this thermal time constant of the winding. So essentially you see between two and three times the continuous torque, the time which is allowed uh, is reduced quite a lot. As a rule of thumb you can say that approximately at two and a half times the continuous torque, it's this time constant here, that's the duration of how long you can overload your motor. So we've been talking about torque and speed and uh, how about current. The most important thing you need to know is that motor current is proportional to the produced torque and there is a proportionality which is given by the torque constant. 
So essentially it means that for each torque value there is a corresponding current value and that's why you can draw also in parallel to the torque axis a current axis down here. And you find the necessary information directly here so for the nominal torque there is a nominal current corresponding and the torque constant here in line 12. What happens if your current is limited? For example, you have a driver with a limited amount of current, let's say a continuous current limit or a short-term current limit, or you have a power supply who has a limited amount of current. Of course, what we've learned, limited current means limited torque. So in our operating range diagram, these areas here are reduced. And for our situation that we have here, it's a big question how can we accelerate here because we don't have the enough current to do this acceleration. So probably you will have to accelerate a little bit at a lower rate. Okay, after this introduction about motor data, I'd like to show you the two main construction principles of DC motors. First, the one with brushes. Uh, at Maxon we have these what's called coreless Maxon DC motors and coreless means that the winding that you see here has no iron core so it's a self-supported wire uh, essentially fixed together with some plastics and this wire rotates so that's on the rotor part connected to the shaft here and here we have the commutator where the brushes run on. Uh, the magnet which is needed in here is fixed on the flange here, so this is uh, and goes into the winding. The really nice thing about brushed motors, brushed DC motors, is that's the most simple motor to run. All you need is a DC voltage. You connect the battery to the motor and it runs, it turns, and the higher the voltage, the faster it rotates. The other concept, of course, is a brushless DC motor. In the brushless DC motors, you don't have brushes. That's why the winding uh, cannot rotate. So it's on the state part and it's in close contact later to the housing. This has a, one advantage is a much better heat dissipation. And the other point is that this time, or on this motors, it's the magnet that are mounted on the shaft and rotate. What you need to drive such a motor typically is some uh, hall sensors some which give information about the position of the magnet so that at the end you can, with a suitable electronics, drive this motor. And that's maybe a disadvantage of these motors. It's not just a simple battery what you need, but you need a piece of electronics in between. By the way, whether you have a brushless or a brushed motor uh, in a deep hole application, uh, the big question is how get, do you get the voltage down there? Uh, you have to consider that uh, over the long lines you will have a quite, a, quite a high uh, drop in voltage and you have to consider this when uh, driving the motor and uh, supplying su uh, enough voltage. And of course you can uh, hardly place uh, these electronics, standard electronics, uh, at 200 centigrades uh, in oil and wherever you want to operate this. So that's a little bit a tricky thing. But what you could do, for example, is use a motor as a generator. So you can also run it the other way around, rotating the shaft and then uh, essentially a voltage comes out of a motor. Maybe that could be an option. Now, let me come now close to the end of this uh, first part. I would like to compare a little bit now a brushed DC motor with a brushless uh, design and see what are the critical components for operation in these extreme environments. Of course, what you have in both motors is uh, you have uh, magnets in there. You have to be careful, is the magnet uh, suitable for this high temperature, for example? Uh, how is the magnet coating? Will the magnet uh, be, uh, uh, how do you say? 
oxidize and uh, corrode, uh, corrosion and so on. That's the word I've, I've been looking for. Uh, very similar things uh, is about plastic adhesives. Uh, do they support the oil? Do they support, support the chemical environment? Uh, the same uh, with high temperature and uh, adhesives and plastics. Then uh, another uh, similar points is in, in vacuum, low level outgassing. Uh, it's always a question of lubricants, they usually they gas out a lot, adhesives gas out a lot. So, but these are problems you have in either type of motor. But what you see here on a brushed motor is that really brushes, uh, yeah, you cannot operate in oil. They, they will not work. Uh, brushes are very sensitive to vibrations and shocks and the brush life will probably be very, very low, uh, particularly also in vacuum because for proper operation of brushes you need a little bit of uh, humidity and you need a bit, little bit of air. On the brushless motors, uh, you have to be careful about hall sensor, that's uh, typically a problem at high temperature. Uh, solder joints you have to take special care of and particularly printed circuit boards also, uh, they have a tendency to gas out in, in vacuum application. But if you compare the two, then you, then I think you can see it yourself that the, probably it's much easier to create a, a brushless or as we call it EC motor into a heavy duty motor. First thing, avoid any glued connections and that's why our heavy duty motor essentially uh, have a lot of uh, stainless steel uh, parts which uh, components which are welded together uh, with the laser welding so this gives a very robust design. Then next thing you have to think about uh, cable insulation, any plastics you're going to use in the winding or in the cable that go in the motor. Uh, you also have to think about uh, winding tabs, uh, which are fully potted to avoid that they loosen in vibrations. And you also have to think about the uh, printed circuit board, uh, make them uh, stronger for high temperature and also check the whole sensors that they can support the high temperature. And the last point you have to do is encapsulate the magnet so that the magnet uh, never sees the harsh environment and use a high temperature magnet for the material. Very similar things apply uh, if you want to make a gear head heavy duty. Again, avoid any adhesives. Uh, that's uh, also press fit only will not be very well suited for high vibration. That's again, we use uh, stainless steel components which are laser welded inside and outside the motor. Then uh, if you have an application in oil, we add uh, holes so the oil can flow in and come out and do the lubrication and take away the heat. So this all helps. And of course to make a gear head very robust, uh, you have to think about using special planet wheels inside to have a stronger bearing at the outside, to have a larger shaft diameter to make it really, really strong. So these were the steps we made and now in the second part I pass over the microphone to Robin and he will, to Robin and he will uh, tell you uh, about tell you testing about of testing heavy, heavy, heavy duty motors. motors. Okay, so the second part of this presentation is really going to show you a little bit about how we went through the development process for these motors and the kind of testing that we did in order to uh, demonstrate that they really are suitable for the environment that uh, we want to, to operate them in. So I'll just uh, start off on a couple of components because effectively that's the level that we would start off in the development process. The first question we had to ask ourselves was how do we come up with a hall sensor that can be used um, at these high temperatures because uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, many of the halls, or nearly all of the hall sensors that you get on the market are only rated to slightly over 150 degrees C. Um, because we have lots of different types of hall sensors here, uh, 
for our range, standard range of motors. We decided the best way to approach this, given that we couldn't find any uh, suitably priced 200 degree C rated temperatures, uh, hall sensors, was simply to, to test all the ones that we, we have. And we tested about 20 different types and came up with um, one type that uh, had the best promise at, at high temperatures. And therefore, we uh, ran lifetime tests on those. And that's sort of uh, the original laboratory setup that we used to see here, where we just had, had them strapped onto a uh, high temperature resistor, heated them up to 210 degrees C, had a magnet spinning in front of them, um, and just ran it continuously whilst monitoring the output, so it powered the whole time. And uh, we had the first failure at over 2,000 hours uh, of operation. And so uh, that was uh, basically how we confirmed that this was the type we were going to use. Um, we get quite a lot of questions about these, and we've, we've uh, now had a total of about uh, 5,000 hall sensors, I think, of this type go into the field, and none of them have failed in, in, uh, in real applications. Um, the rotor, which uh, Urs briefly touched on earlier, where he said that uh, one of the things we do is remove the adhesive from it. Um, and encapsulate it. And uh, what we actually do here is we take a solid cylinder magnet and then we shrink a tube over the top of it. And then we take two shaft stubs and push those in from both ends, weld them shut, um, and then grind them to get everything perfectly concentric. And that's how we then have our fully encapsulated rotor. But what we need to do there is then confirm that all of these joints are going to be suitable um, for the, the stresses that they're going to see. So what you're seeing here is a, what we call our water rotor torture test rig, and this just twists it backwards and forwards with uh, 6 newton meters was the torque rating that we used here, which is uh, factors of 10 more than the motor is capable of delivering. And we did 13 million cycles before abandoning the test. Um, Similarly, because we don't have exactly the same expansion coefficients for the magnets and the housing that we're using, because of course they're different materials, uh, we had to confirm that over the full temperature range we still have the, the press fit, because otherwise the magnet will rotate inside the, uh, the housing. And so we first of all performed 10 temperature cycles between minus 55 degrees C and plus 300 degrees C, so that um, the the material has a chance to go into the slightly plastic deformation that it will have at the very low temperatures. Um, did that 10 times, then we heat the whole thing up to 300 degrees C, and then uh, ro try and forcibly rotate the magnets inside the housing to confirm that the uh, torque required to do that is significantly more than the stall torque of the motor. Um, so that's just two examples out of many that I could have shown for the um, overall testing uh, of the components. Then we move on to testing the complete assembly. So we have um, vibration, a, a vibration table shaker that's combined with an environment chamber, which is what you're seeing in the bottom right here. The black section underneath is the shaker, and then the two the, the components to be tested go inside the, uh, uh, the environment chamber here. And uh, then we run vertical and horizontal vibration tests. Um, at low temperature and at high temperature. Um, then comes the question, how do we do the testing in oil? And originally, um, we, uh, we, we looked into the formal test facilities that you can buy for doing that and decided they were far too expensive for us at the beginning when we didn't know whether we were really going to have a market in this area or not. So we started off just simply with standard deep food, deep fat flyer, fryers, which we filled with hydraulic oil rather than chip pan oil. Uh, modified the, uh, the circuitry on them to enable us to heat them up beyond what the uh, manufacturers originally wanted and uh, ran our tests like that. As soon as we'd seen that we were going in the right direction here, we moved on to slightly more sophisticated uh, uh, fryers running them outside because of the amount of uh, smell we were producing. And only after we then demonstrated that we were going to be capable of building motors and that you know, there was actually a market for them did we start to invest in, in uh, more formal equipment. And we built, this is out of the back of our factory, we built a standalone container with fireproof walls in it. 
uh, with a filtration system on it because we have a, a farmhouse directly behind us. We have to be careful that we don't annoy our neighbours with, with the fumes. Um, we moved on to laboratory um, uh, heaters. Um, we, start, we had this kind of standard configuration to start with where the motor and gearbox are mounted at the bottom and then a brake is used to simulate a load on top. Um, and then we started uh, adding different sizes, so these are brakes that are needed for the higher torque, larger motors in, in the series that we're doing. And basically the, then there's a, a bunch of logging um, equipment in order to be able to obviously collect the data as we're running the, running the tests. And this is sort of the current setup that we have where there's now five of these tests, um, test rigs in there. We have uh, fairly deep oil baths, different size brakes on top, capable of going up to a couple of hundred newton meters, which is sized for the maximum torque that you can get out of the uh, gearboxes that are in this size range that we, that we produce. Um, and then, of course, all the associated control, also associated control electronics. Um, I'll pick out a couple of sort of interesting test results that um, I, I think are worth mentioning. One is no load current in, in oil. So the green line represents the current that the motor draws at a particular speed um, when running in air. And as soon as you, of course, immerse these motors in oil, then you get additional friction drag for the rotation of the rotor internally to the motor. And there's, there's something of a conflict here between um, an optimal design that in all our standard motors, what we aim for is to have the smallest possible air gap between the rotor and the, the winding. Because the smaller the air cut gap, the better the magnetic fields interact between the permanent magnets and the uh, electric magnetic field that we're producing with the winding. Um, and that's how you produce a high power compact motor is by keeping this gap as small as possible. But of course, if this gap is small and then filled with a viscous fluid, you get a significant amount of extra drag. And then there's two factors that, that come into this. There's one is the temperature that the oil is at. Um, so the viscosity of the oil decreases as you increase the temperature. Uh, so that works in our favor. Um, then unfortunately, as you increase the pressure, you also increase the, the viscosity again. So that works against us. Um, but the, uh, so, so one of the things that you have to be careful when you're trying to lay out your overall design is that you restrict the motor speed and don't let it go to too higher, higher speeds. So uh, that means juggling with the gearbox ratio that you choose. Um, if you have a gearbox in there, the, uh, this graph looks like the situation is worse, but it's not really because it's just going to higher, higher speeds. So the vast majority of our applications that we see customers actually using these combinations out or down at the five to 10,000 RPM range. Um, but that's certainly a, some, an issue that you have to consider when you're sizing out the correct type of motor. Um, just picking up here a couple of uh, the uh, initial test results that, that, that we had. This, is, this one's now about uh, five years old from when we, we built the first running samples. Um, in a no-load configuration, we were able to put them in, in the oven at 260 degrees C um, and, and run them continuously for, for several days. Now, we don't actually, if you look at our catalog, you'll see we don't actually rate them at this temperature. We have a certain amount of margin in there. Um, and we're suggesting a maximum temperature for the winding of 240 degrees C, um, which lets you place the motors in an ambient temperature of uh, anything up to a little bit over 200 degrees C and still get a 30 degree margin for the winding, which of course then heats up as it does work. Um, so you can still get quite a high power output in a 200 degree C ambient surrounding. The higher you go, so all the components in the motor are rated to 240 or higher. So you can go all the way up to 235, but then you only have a very small amount of extra heat that you can allow to go into the, into the winding. Um, We've just, uh, to, to demonstrate that it's, the cold temperature starting is not an issue, we've also done cold temperature tests. Uh, you, you get, an ex as you might expect, at minus 70 degrees C, uh, a, a short burst uh, of, of high current draw whilst the, uh, the grease gets moving. But after that, uh, there's no real issues. Um, 
then a large fraction of our testing over the last few years has gone into lifetime testing at different loads. And especially if you look at the gearbox, um, the gearbox uh, talk ratings in our in our catalog, they're normally set out quite conservatively to deliver thousand hour life or more lifetimes. Um, we've noticed that there's quite a lot of people who want to use, especially in the oil industry, who want to use uh, motors or, or compact gearboxes at significantly higher ratings than we would normally give out. Um, but are quite happy with that because they don't need the full lifetime. And so that's what this graph sort of shows is that um, a, a GP22, in this case a 22 millimeter diameter gearbox, which we would normally rate at somewhere around uh, 3 newton meters. You can in fact quite happily take it up to 6, 8, 10 or even higher. We've got one customer who actually runs this, this gearbox at 19 newton meters. Um, and as long as you're willing to accept uh, that it, the, the, the total operational lifetime drops to below 100 hours, um, then that works fine. So there's people who move just valves, for example, that has a, a few second duty cycle and they want to do that only a few times per cycle that the, uh, the motor or gearbox is down hole. Uh, that works just fine for them. Uh, one point that's maybe worth noting, uh, it, it, the oil operation that we do, uh, because we don't have a sealed system here the way that most uh, applications in the field would do, um, the uh, oil gets very dirty and, uh, and oxidizes and so we end up with I think significantly worse quality oil that we're running in than, uh, than a real application would do. Um, I thought I'd just show some of the learning experience that we went through during our early development uh, a few years ago. Um, of course, we didn't get everything right the first time, uh, as might, might be expected. So the vibration testing showed us that, especially at low temperatures, we had to be careful uh, that the winding taps, uh, if they're not potted the way it's done here, or shown here, uh, the winding taps do break under vibration. Uh, the original press fits and wells that we had, the welding wasn't deep enough to, uh, to provide the, the, the uh, strength for the joint at the front. Um, so the solution to, to the winding tap problem was to, uh, to pop the winding. So here we've cut open one of the windings and you can see the way the top section now is filled with, with adhesive. So the top left here is, normal, is before it's been filled. There you see the little bits of wire. And uh, after you've potted it, then uh, this is what it looks like. Like, and we cover up all the top section here as well. Uh, we then extended that about uh, three years ago to potting the entire winding, uh, because of issues we were having uh, where the oil was being dragged at high speed over the surface of the winding, and was particles in the oil, if it wasn't perfectly clean, were gradually stripping away the insulation on the oil uh, on the winding, eventually leaving blank wires here. So to solve that we now pot the entire system including here. So here's the circuit board ends. You can just about still make out the remnants of the taps under there. And this is the bottom end. So the left and right pictures here are this, uh, basically so the shape, the same thing before and after potting. Um, this potting uh, we started off with doing this uh, in a more sort of uh, laboratory style and we're now moving on to having uh, automated machines doing that as we move into uh, more volume production. Um, PCB testing, um, the standard rules of thumb that you use for laying out uh, how thick a PCB needs to be and how thick the tracks are uh, don't apply when you're running at these high temperatures. So the, the standard designs that we use had to be had to be adapted and this is just to show you how we did that. We uh, took uh, the PCBs, we just soldered uh, wire stubs onto them to simulate the winding and then you pump the rated amount of power through this that you wanted to monitor it with, a, with an IR camera and uh, based on these results we could then see where the weak spots were in the, whole cent in the uh, PCBs and, uh, and design those weak spots out. Um, we also noticed, as I think uh, many people in the oil industry know, or everybody probably knows, uh, uh, the type of hydraulic oil that you use is, is, uh, is key. Um, we didn't have this experience here, so we just started using various different types, some that had been recommended by uh, customers, some that uh, we had, had suggested uh, ourselves, and we discovered that you can really have a, a, a big difference uh, as to how long the, the exposed parts of the, uh, of the windings or of the electrical system 
uh, work uh, because the, the solder is attacked. As you can see, that these are the same solder joints before and after um, a 700 hour test, I think this was. Um, and you can see the way that the, uh, the panelin on the left here has eaten away at the solder joints. This was also one of our motivations for then fully potting the system so that uh, you're basically free as a customer to use whatever kind of oil is good for the rest of your system without the motor constraining that. Um, another discovery from a few years ago, uh, new for us, but I know not necessarily new for you, uh, was that if you ha don't leave sufficient gaps between unprotected areas, uh, that you can get carbon build up between them, and this carbon build up then of course starts conducting, and eventually it yields, uh, leads to short circuiting. So again, this, this has now been dealt with by uh, fully potting this. Uh, the soldering standard that uh, we're, we're following is the IPC uh, standard where we, we aim for uh, this class 3 standard uh, solder joints uh, as required for um, uh, extreme environment applications and ones where failure uh, of, of solder joints can't be accepted. Uh, this requires uh, things like a new, new uh, soldering stations uh, where we can also heat with, uh, with uh, hot nitrogen air and then we use um, jigs to also heat up the winding uh, because otherwise given the thickness of the winding taps and the thickness of the PCBs that we're having to use here you can't get enough heat in through a conventional uh, soldering iron alone. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite tests for uh, stressing all the joints. What we do is we take the, uh, take the motor, we run it uh, in air, so that uh, there's a minimal cooling here. We attach a, uh, a flywheel to the front, or basically an inertial mass, and then we switch the motor backwards and forwards between clockwise and anti-clockwise rotation at the maximum speed or duty cycle that we can we can apply to cause the winding to heat up to 240 degrees C. So this this means you're applying uh, tens of amps. Um, every couple of seconds to switch the direction of the motor. And of course that causes a huge shock on all the components that are connected together uh, as, as the torque direction changes. And uh, this plot uh, shows how uh, we, we ran 3 million cycles uh, before, uh, before the uh, bearings in fact were what caused the failure here in this, in this test. Um, well, as mentioned, a couple of uh, other applications that are outside of the oil industry, so one of them is, is UHV applications. Um, the reason the motors which turned out to be suitable for ultra-high vacuum applications is uh, simply because we've got rid of nearly all the uh, plastics. Uh, the only adhesive that's still used is to, uh, to bond the winding and, and perform the potting. That's all the same type. Um, and of course, you can bake that. You can then bake these motors at very high temperatures, so you get rid of any residual uh, material that's on the or contaminants that's on on, are on the stainless steel surfaces. And uh, this gives uh, a plot that shows the before and after bakeouts uh, that was done by one of our one of our customers. Um, and so we have a couple of these running at places like CERN, uh, where really high uh, requirements are needed for for the uh, the outgassing levels. Um, so just to, to finish off a quick summary of uh, what kind of products we now have available, we've, we've built up over the, uh, the last uh, four to five years that we've had these on the market, uh, three basic sizes, a 22 millimeter diameter, 32 millimeter diameter and a 42 millimeter diameter motor. You can see the approximate air and oil power ratings here, uh, so the, the largest one is, is up into the kilowatt range when it's run in oil. Um, there's matching gearboxes, uh, so planetary gearboxes, um, ranging from about 3 to 1 to about a 1,000 to 1 ratio. So, um, and the motors themselves are done in different lengths, depending on uh, the amount of power you really need out of them. So this is the 22 millimeter one, uh, longer and a shorter one. And the, the larger motors we do in three sizes are long and medium and a short. The power ratings up here are all for the long versions. Um, then we also have screw drive um, models that where the gearbox has an integrated either ball screw 
metric screw or trapezium screw. So basically this can be any kind of screw type that you, you define. Um, the key thing to note about this is that the axial bearing is in integrated, so, so the, also the thrust bearing rather, is, is integrated into the gearbox. So it's not just attached through standard rotary bearings, but it's one that's, uh, or ball bearings, but it's one that can absorb the several thousand newtons of load uh, and still deliver the, uh, the, the long lifetime. So the way that's done is, is you can see in this, this picture here, the shaft with the screw on it coming in from the left. Uh, the final stage of the planetary gearbox is here. There's two standard ball bearings here to do the, uh, the, the guiding um, and, and, and radial loads and uh, the axial bearings here to accept the axial loads or thrust bearings. Um, I think we've already mentioned a little bit about the applications. The main ones that we've sold the products into so far is the biggest one area is, is the oil industry. Um, then the next biggest is UHV, and then the two smaller ones at the moment are um, uh, deep sea submersibles and, and spacecraft applications. Um, maybe I'll just show the one example of how we modify this for the, the motors for the different um, the different uh, market segments. Uh, this is the deep sea submersible version uh, where the motor is fully flooded with oil and then sealed after we complete the manufacturing by putting a, 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 a rotary ball seal on the front of the gearbox. All the holes of course are removed, um, all the joints are welded shut and on the back we have a sealed connector rather than the wires coming out. This sealed connector, incidentally, is, is, is also an option on the, on the standard type. Um, and then finally, you have a pressure bladder. This is just a temporary one that's shown in the picture here. Uh, so that you can uh, balance the pressure in here with the outside pressure and the expansion of the oil with temperature has the, uh, the, uh, the oil has somewhere to go when it expands. And so uh, this, can, this can be placed directly in salt water, and so this is actually the motor in running in salt water. And uh, we demonstrated four weeks of continuous operation in, in here before the, uh, the connector on the back here corroded away because this, uh, the, the, the mating connector for the, the, the test was not, um, was not a, an underwater rated one. Um, so with that, I think we, uh, we've completed our presentation. So if there's going to be any further questions, um, I guess we've probably uh, missed the 10 questions I see that have come in here. So maybe we'll just run through those to start with. Um, so the first question is, can you run sensorless brushed motors in a downhole environment? So the answer to that is yes, uh, providing you have a sensorless controller. Uh, so we do have customers who do that. Um, Urs was mentioning at the beginning um, uh, an issue about the voltage drop um, if you run cables down. So of course, uh, uh, there's uh, the majority of downhole tools that I'm aware of run on battery power um, and high temperature rated electronics. And it's worth pointing out at this point that the electronics that you see in our catalog, we do not sell for high temperature rating. We, ratings. We have um, partners in the oil industry who have more experience at doing high temperature um, uh, control electronics uh, and we would just advise you to go to contact them if you need high temperature electronics. Um, but the, so the sensorless operation is certainly possible. Um, what's the high temperature limit for, for, for these motors? So we are saying 240 degrees C for the windings and therefore um, the motor itself and the gearbox itself has to be placed in something that's slightly below that so you can get any use, some useful work out of them. Uh, the majority of applications I'm aware of are in the range 180 to 200 degrees C. And that's where we've done most of our testing because we can't go any higher than that because the oil, when it's, not, when it's exposed to oxygen, will start smoking above those temperatures. So uh, the Two thousand, we've demonstrated it's about two and a half thousand hours of continuous operation with the rated load on these motors and these gearboxes, so the three newton meters on the 22 millimeter gearbox, for example, in oil, uh, in our test facility, where the oil is at 180 to 185 degrees. So. 
and that there's no failure after two and a half thousand hours. That's just when we abort the test. Um, so then there's a question on polyamide, polyamide PCB material. Um, so the question is whether it's uh, because we chose that whether it's high temp because of its high temperature performance or whether it's mechanical property. So it's because of the high temperature performance. Um, we uh, have aircraft applications, for example, or spacecraft applications where we use FR4, um, which is fine for its mechanical capabilities there. Um, it's purely we switched to polyamide purely for the temperature rise. Um, how much temperature percentage should the values in any maximum motor cat catalog vary because of the power losses? Um, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Um, so, so, I mean, all the losses are incorporated in the ratings that we give. So, joule losses, for example, or eddy currents, that's all incorporated in the ratings that you see there. So, you don't need to worry about any of, the, uh, any of those in your, in your calculations. And so, is the full sense of failure rate related to operating time or only time exposed to the high temperature? So. Um, it's operating time uh, that we saw the failure after. So when it's continuously being powered and seeing a moving magnetic field in front of it. Um, we have not seen any failures when they're not turned on um, or when they're not powered on. Um, although, I mean, admittedly, we've only tested for a few thousand additional hours there. We're using hall sensors at 260 degrees C. No, uh, the hall sensors, uh, their signal starts to fade away at about 210 degrees C. Uh, they're still just about usable to 220, um, but uh, anything above that, they don't work. What's the mode of failure of the gearbox? So if you um, if you overload them in a, on a short period of time. Uh, these standard gearboxes break by um, usually the pins inside that, that guide the output stage uh, gears snap off. Um, we've compensated as much as possible for uh, for that by using hard the, 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 the best steel types that we can and by putting supporting plates on the um, the back of the output stage so that the pins spread the load out across each gear. Um, but ultimately you're limited by the strength of the material that you're using there. Um, the failure modes over longer term operation, so uh, you're running them for, for, for many hours and eventually they fail, it's usually um, wear on the teeth of the, of the gears. Uh, or on the, on the pins themselves. Uh, in, in, in air operation, we normally see the pins wearing out first, but because the lubrication is so good when they're in oil, it's uh, generally the, the teeth themselves. Um, so these HD gearboxes, we change the thickness of the gears as you go towards the output stage, because obviously there's more torque on them there. So the uh, and, and we add additional gears. So the input stage has three fin planetary gears on it. Then the second stage would have uh, three thick gears on it. And then we move to four thick gears. And then the final output stage has doubled up thickness. Um, there's some cutaways I think that we have in our catalog that sort of show that a bit, a bit better if you want to look into that more. Uh, are there any reliability or performance issues with full sensors operating, meaning motor starting at less than minus 40 degrees C? In my experience, they're only rated to minus 40 based on data sheets. So that's correct. Um, the vast majority of full sensors are only rated to minus 40. We've been through this exercise um, for very low temperatures for many of our aircraft applications where um, we need the motors to be rated at the minus 55 degrees C mil spec that uh, most commercial aircraft are rated at. Um, and the whole sensor that we are actually using in here 
It's the same one that's used in the, for the high temperature. Um, we've extensively qualified, and so have uh, companies like Boeing. Uh, where, like Boeing 787, we have uh, 44 motors per aircraft that have these sensors in them. So there's uh, 44 times 3 sensors in each aircraft. And um, they've been qualified without any trouble at minus 55 degrees C. And obviously the cycling there that goes on is, is um, significantly more than it would be for most oil industry applications because the aircraft is being cycled every time it flies. Have you considered using fluorinated oils like Crytox? Um, so we, we spent some time wondering whether we should be recommending an oil for use with these with these motors. And in the end, we decided that wasn't helpful because so many of our customers put a lot of efforts into finding what they consider the perfect oil for the rest of their application. And we therefore decided that we should be concentrating on having the motors capable of running in any oil that the customer chooses. So that was the justification for that. Uh, what's the melting point of the solder? I believe it's 305 degrees C or 306, or something like that. What about leakage across the bearing seals? Um, I guess that was referring to my sealed motor comments. So, so the standard motors as we sell them for the oil applications is they're deliberately open. The bearings are not sealed. There's no covers on them. And that's to encourage the oil to flow through the motor as much as possible um, because that aids the cooling. Um, if you're referring to the oil uh, immersed, sorry, the immersed oil flooded version, uh, the bearings are inside behind the seals. So there's, there's a shaft seal. It's, it's made by Ball Seal. It's a known company for producing rotary shaft seals. Um, and it's rated to one bar pressure difference between one side and the other. And so um, the issue of leaking doesn't really arise. What would be the typical modifications needed for a motor to be used in space? So the space industry has a whole different set of requirements. Uh, as you may know, Maxon built um, all of the uh, DC brushed motors that are on the Spirit and Opportunity rovers on Mars, or the MER rovers. Um, and we currently have a big development project running for the European Space Agency's ExoMars rover. Um, so we know a little bit about what has to be done here. And um, typical examples are uh, the, the, the wiring needs to be changed from Teflon to Kapton. Um, the uh, wiring type internally would maybe be different. Some of the materials used we would switch for lower, out -ga for, for lower outgassing types. Uh, but the, the biggest differences really are just the sourcing of the material. The space industry for, for um, uh, all of its flight hardware uh, wants fully traced material with material uh, uh, certificates to prove that the type of steel that we said we were using in the flange really is the type of steel that was used in the flange. Um, Whereas, and so whereas normally we, for our standard products, and this includes the HD series, we would be relying on material certifications from our suppliers um, for the space applications. We make them deliver um, proof of measure, uh, so a measurement of, of the material that was delivered, that was used. Geothermal logging tools do not usually run off the batteries. Um, correct. So. We also have a project running at the moment that's only in its early stages um, for running motors with high voltage rated windings. So we've started on, we've concentrated on the EC32 HD to start with. Um, and we have a 600 volt rated winding there. Um, and the idea then is you have a high voltage power supply on the surface and uh, you just run a very high voltage down your multi-kilometer long wires and you still have close to 600 volts when it arrives at the motor. Um, the EC22 at the moment we have a development project with a launch customer for um, rating it for 225 volts. So if you're interested in this you can uh, I'll, I'll, ask about it, but you should be aware that uh, it's not something that's been through lots of field testing yet.
Uh, it's basically just uh, in, in the uh, early laboratory testing stage. Is there a minimum RPM for sensorless motors? I think I'll let Urs answer that one. Yeah. I think we looks like she's on mute, isn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you run a sensorless, you run a motor, sensorless motors, you need a minimum, need a minimum speed, speed, speed because uh, sensorless uh, electronics will not, uh, you cannot run it in a real sensorless uh, mode at low speed. Uh, sensorless motors at low speed will be operated uh, like step mode. So the minimum speed typically is about, uh, for these modes, is uh, 500 RPMs and higher, I guess. So the Sorry. next one is, do you have motor drives that enable you to achieve full motor performance of the largest oil field motor? And so the answer to that is no. Um, I think uh, somewhere around about 500 watts is the maximum that our drives are able to, to do. Does the 4 to 1 oil air torque ratio also applies to gear box gear heads um, uh, I think it was the the operating range diagram of the motor in oil is about three to four times higher than the one in air right so um, no the ultimate rating of the gearbox stays about the same so when the components fail internally they'll do that at the same rate at uh, the same torque level as whether they're in air or in oil. But what is much better in oil is the lifetime at high loads. So where an air operated gearbox has to lubricate itself via the grease that's in there, that grease will rapidly crack because of the pressure that's being applied to it when you put a heavy torque on it. And once the grease cracks and the, uh, it no longer lubricates properly and, you, and then you get where, where related failures within a few hours usually. Um, whereas that similar kind of load running in oil could run for tens or hundreds of hours. The graph I showed of lifetimes was the oil lifetime. After a motor fails, presumably due to heat, is there much hope in repairing it and using it or is it more common to replace the motor? So our general statement there is our motors are not repairable. They're sealed units in part because of the amount of welding that we put on them. And uh, in general, they should not be considered uh, repairable. So someone says, I'm using an EC 4-pole 32 brushless 480 watts motor with a 33 to 1 gear box. Uh, what does it mean of the starting current, which is the 53 amps described in the maximum uh, specifications sheet? So the, the starting current is in any motor when you, if you don't limit the power draw when you turn, when you turn it on, will draw the starting current for a fraction of a second. So it's down below, well below the microsecond level whilst it speeds up, because uh, if, if you consider it for the first nanosecond or so, you have a, a stationary rotor, you have a stationary rotor, and it has to, and that's effectively the same as, as a fully stalled motor, and therefore it pulls the stall current to get started. But that drops off extremely rapidly, and of course any real power supply isn't capable of delivering that, or, or any normal power supply is not capable of delivering that. So the motor doesn't actually start up as fast as it would normally be able to do. Um, and so, to some degree, that's a bit of an artificial number. There. But that's basically the explanation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, be aware that the starting current only will be there if you apply the nominal voltage. So, if you apply a lower voltage, it's this current will be lower. If you apply a higher voltage, it will be higher. Have you measured viscous losses in thinner oils, for example, in low temperature applications? Um, so no, we uh, used one type of oil um, and we've got the data that we can distribute on the, vis the published viscosity of that oil at different temperatures. So effectively those, some of those lines that were in that plot, we, although they're labeled with temperature there, we could also label them with viscosity. And that would then enable you to say if you selected a, uh, an oil with a defined 
by the manufacturer of viscosity level, you could predict what the uh, what the viscous losses would be. And I think that's the last question that's been sent here. So I guess we pass this back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you for that informative webinar, and thanks to all the participants today. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, Maxon Motor AG and Electromate. Um, just as a reminder, please visit our website, motioncontrolonline.org, where you can find uh, numerous motion control resources, including the webinar recordings uh, from all our past webinars, as well as the upcoming webinar schedule for this, the rest of this year. Um, I believe we answered, uh, the, the presenters were able to answer most of the questions. If any came in um, um, since they ended, uh, we will record those and they can get back to you after the, the webinar ends. Um, and just one more reminder that this webinar has been recorded and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. Um, thank you so much again to our presenters and thanks everyone for listening. Have a great day.